So we're moving into nervous system. The way these classes are ordered in order are a little bit different from other colleges as St. Elizabeth's and the nursing department wanted you to have cardiothoracic, cardiovascular I should say, and respiratory. In order to understand those, we've got to understand the nervous system. So this is why it's a little bit of a different order than you're following in your book. Okay? So before I forget, you'll have to watch Skin at Home on your own. Okay? I pick and choose chapters that are fairly easy for you to watch at home and or it's necessary for you to watch at home. Skin is just pretty easy, okay? But don't forget to review it as you will have questions on that for your exam, okay? So, your next lecture exam, and that's a ways off, don't worry about that. But your lab exam is coming up, right? That'll be beginning the end of this week, I believe, for most of us, through the beginning of the following week that will cover everything in your lab book up to and including skin. Please don't forget the regional terms, the planes, all those things will be on there. I think people skim over them thinking, oh, it's so easy. They, those are, they are easy, they're easy points. Okay, so make sure you study those so you can for sure get as many lab points as possible. Okay, so we're gonna move through several lectures with nervous system. And the fun thing with nervous system is we're going to start to move into more bread and butter stuff. I'm going to be teaching you things that you will actually use clinically and you'll be able to apply, which is fun. We're going to begin with nervous tissue, then we'll move into central and peripheral nervous system and autonomic nervous system. So there are some basics that we'll introduce and then we'll elaborate from there. Okay? Any questions? The nervous system is so important because it's one of the main controllers of the body. Between the nervous system and the endocrine system, which is our hormonal system, those are the two major players in the ability to control our actions, our reactions, and how we function. The better you have an understanding of those two systems, the better you can help with your diagnosis. Okay, so it does make it a little bit more fun. These are pictures of nerves. We're going to look at them more in depth. We look at them in lab in a very basic way. Okay, we're going to look at them in lecture in a very complicated way because they have very complex functions. So, just starting with something fun. This is a CAT scan of what? Brain. The brain. Very good. What plane created this view? Transverse. Transverse or horizontal. We're looking down in the brain. So we have solid matter in the brain, do we not? We also have spaces. Inside those spaces we have what? Fluid. We have what's called cerebral spinal fluid, which helps the brain to somewhat be nourished and also <clears throat> helps to protect the brain. We're going to go through all this, okay? Just giving you a once over. Does this look like a normal brain? No. What do you think might be happening in this brain? So once again, it's transverse horizontal. This, I believe, is an MRI. So we have the solid tissue on both sides, but the previous brain looked different in that it was bilateral and symmetrical, was it not? So let's break those two words down. Bilateral means both sides, both sides and symmetrical means same shape. So what we're looking at here most likely, just to go back to that previous picture, oh, that actually, that actually is not quite as bilateral symmetrical as I thought. There's actually a little dark spot here, okay? It's probably some sort of what, do you think, tumor of some sort. You can really see it in this picture. If this was a normal brain, it would be nice and even on both sides, okay? Do we think that tumors are good? in the nervous system? No. How about benign tumors? Are those good in the nervous system? No. Why? They're just good and present on the brain. So let's talk about, and you said it, let's talk about the difference. So benign means it doesn't what? Spread. Right? Malignant tumors spread to the surrounding tissue, bloodstream, lymphatics, etc. With nerves in any part of the body, nerves don't like pressure. 
So even though this may be a benign tumor, which I don't think it is, because there's other things. I'm just pointing this out clinically, because I want to start tying in some clinical stuff for you. Even if it is benign, nerves don't like pressure. Nerves in the brain, nerves in the extremities, nerves in the spinal cord. Okay. If you push too long on a nerve, it will decrease its function. I had a massive herniation pushing on a nerve on the right side of my lower spine. And I had numbness and tingling down my leg, horrific, horrific numbness and tingling down my leg. But when I went to the neurosurgeon, guess what the really dangerous sign was? Is that nerve had so much pressure on it for so long, what did I start to lose? No. Hmm? That's the right track, sort of. So I had loss of sensation. I still do because that nerve is permanently damaged. This is how I had to walk in. Okay, I was starting to lose what? Muscle. Muscle. Motor control. Because it was pushing on that nerve for so long because I'm stubborn and I kept trying to take care of it myself, it damaged that nerve. So if you continue pressure on nerves anywhere, could be in the brain, extremities, spinal cord, you will permanently damage those nerves after a while. They'll stop functioning. Okay? So, this is actually a PET scan, which will show the uptake of substances in the brain, and it shows the function. So it's another diagnostic test if you're eliminating other things and you can't figure out what's going on. A PET scan may be another tool that you can use diagnostically. Same view, transverse horizontal. What's happening here? Do you think we're moving up in the brain or down in the brain? Slice-wise. Down. Yeah, because what do we see at the top of the screen now? Eyeballs. Eyeballs, right? <clears throat> moving into the eyeballs. This, any guess what this is? Sinuses. Yeah, these will actually be the sinus cavities. Maybe part of the sinuses over here. And then this is moving into your brain stump and the base of the skull. So don't forget when you're doing those diagnostic studies, <clears throat> you'll do several slices to get a true diagnostic picture. What plane would create this view? Sagittal. Sagittal, very nice. So which way do you think the patient's facing? That way or this way? Yeah, this way. Okay, because here's the sinus cavity once again. There's your uvula, that little dangly thing in the back of your throat. There's the opening to the posterior aspect of the oral cavity. And so you're looking at a sagittal view of the brain. So whenever you do CAT scan or an MRI of a patient, you'll do those transverse and horizontal, coronal, and sagittal. So that way it works almost like a um, longitude and latitude on a map. So you can really figure out where the problem is and also the size and the extent of what the problem is. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. And then this view would be frontal. frontal or coronal. Very good. This is the cerebellum or the base of the brain and these are the two what are called cerebral hemispheres. <coughs> Excuse me. Surrounding your brain, this is actually a good picture because this is bone, this is brain, and here you're going to have several protective layers we're going to talk about in the future. Okay, they're called the, begins with an M, meninges. We're going to talk about those. Your brain, if you were to actually you know, pop your head open and pull your brain out and not preserve it, it's like a thick pudding. The brains that we work at within lab have been preserved, so they've desiccated or lost some of their fluid, and they're spongy, like a pink pearl eraser, but our brains are like a thick pudding. So we have this dura mater and the skull around it to protect it and hold it in place so it doesn't slosh around in there, right? I know, icky, huh? I like those analogies, because you have to remember them, right? Okay. And then there's that transverse view again through or horizontal with names of structures and we'll get into them as we learn the different segments of the brain. Okay. 
And once again, what do we see here to the right? Probably some sort of tumor. Good. The whole gist of the nervous system is so simple. Okay. You have sensory, processing, and motor. Think about it. That's just about it. Where it gets complicated is the pathways and the processing, right? Sensory is just nerves that brings that sensation in to the spinal cord, to the brain. Motor is your response to that sensory input if, if some is needed. Okay. So it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Right. But it's really complicated because there's so many stops between. So the controller and the integrator is your brain. Okay. We bring that sensory information. I don't know what he's sensing, really, right? I just looked at this picture for the first time, really. He's not doing anything. But, you know, whatever information he's seeing visually, smelling, feeling, comes in. The brain goes, you're sitting in front of a glass of water. You should be doing more than that. It says, get up and get moving, right? He decides to drink the water. All right. It's pretty lame. I don't want you to know that I really look at that picture. But that's the general gist of it. Where it gets complicated is all the steps. Okay? And we're going to go through that step by step. We already know this, right? Central versus peripheral nervous system. So central nervous system is our brain and our spinal cord. Peripheral is the nerves that come off of that and go to the periphery. Okay? What that is broken down into the peripheral nervous system is spinal nerves. So you have spinal nerves from your neck down that go to your arms, your torso, and your legs that will sense information coming from those areas and create motor responses in those areas. Cranial nerves are very specialized. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that provide the sensory and motor information basically from the neck up. Vision, taste, hearing, sensation on the face, right? Because your face and your brain are the main uh, boss, right, of the body, sensing what's going on, okay? So we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and we'll go through them, don't worry about it, that are part of that peripheral nervous system. Okay? Now, the cranial nerves will come off the base of the brain and also the brain stem. The spinal nerves come from cervical, thoracic, and upper lumbar spine. So if you could kind of group those together, right, from the skull or from the lower aspect. So from the, low, from the neck down will be spinal. From the base of the skull and the brain will be cranial. Makes sense, right? Cranium. Okay. All right. So this is just a constant process, and I pretty much went over this. Information is going to be sensory. It's also known as afferent fibers. I have a mnemonic for you guys. We'll go over that in the future. Information out, motor or afferent fibers. And then we're constantly maintaining this unless we have a disease process, okay? Um, what would that be in the brain? So, you know, multiple things can cause a disease process. One of the first things we talked about was tumors. Okay, what else do we see in elderly that causes a dysfunction of their brain? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. It, that's huge, right? Parkinson's, MS, right? The list goes on and on. So if we have a dysfunction, those nerves won't function as efficiently, and we can get all sorts of signs and symptoms, okay, depending on where it is. <clears throat> So, nervous system has two principal parts. So, soma or somatic means body. This is your voluntary part of your nervous system, controlling how you move and function throughout day to day. Okay, you get up, you decide what you're going to wear, you walk to class, all those voluntary decisions. As opposed to autonomic, 
I always think of autonomic as being automatic. This is your digestion, reproduction, how you produce eggs and sperm, release of hormones, okay? Anything that happens automatically in the body is under the auspices of autonomic division. We're gonna talk about this in its own complete chapter, but just briefly, trying to get stuff into your head. There's sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. If somebody opened that door and let a bear into this room, you would kick into fight or flight, right? And all the benefits of that are pretty obvious. Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, release of glucose into your system. The release of hormones that release glucose into your system, because we use glucose for what again? Energy, right? Increased respiratory rate. Those are all under that sympathetic. But being scared is not the only time that we facilitate the sympathetic nervous system or turn it on, right? Who worked out this morning? Okay. You're like, I did, but oh, I may mean, know because nobody else has raised their hand. I saw your hand, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna tell you who it was. I did too, so we're on the same plan, right? You use your sympathetic nervous system to work out too. So it's not a total extreme, okay? Parasympathetic is when you rest, rejuvenate, you eat, you digest. And it's a constant balance between these two throughout the day. You can't be in one extreme all the time, okay? You balance throughout the day depending on what you have to do, okay? Does that make sense? Like I said, we're gonna go over that again. This is just a general introduction. Some people love this chart, some people hate it. <laughs> I won't test you off this chart, I will test you out of your notes. It breaks it down to central, peripheral, okay, sensory, motor, motors divided into somatic, which is that voluntary and autonomic. And then here's your sympathetic, parasympathetic. It's pretty much everything we went over in a chart. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, by all means, just use the notes. Okay, some people love it, some people hate it. Once again, it's just another tool that I'm trying to give you to use. Okay. This isn't gonna completely make sense, but I'm gonna teach it to you, and then as we go, we'll read more information that will help you to understand it, okay? It's just a silly little mnemonic that helps you to, well, you can understand the basics of it. Understand where sensory nerves are and motor nerves are coming off the spinal cord. This is also somewhat true in the brain, okay? So let me go over the mnemonic first. Hopefully I have a pen that works. Good, i to remember to take this pen with me. Okay, so DASIP, stupidest mnemonic that somebody taught me in school, but it works, Momoa. So we need to know where motor nerves come off of the cord and where sensory nerves go into the cord. So sensory, we already learned, is incoming or outgoing? Incoming. And we learned in the notes earlier that that is, or another word for incoming information is afferent. Why? Just because that's how they named it, okay? Sensory or incoming information goes into the posterior of the cord, okay? Posterior, another word for that is dorsal. So we're gonna look at a little picture of the cord and we're gonna have sensory nerves back here and there's a little collection of cell bodies there too, we'll talk about it. And guess what's in the front of the cord? Sensory's back here. Motor. 
So if we were to cut me in half and look down at my spinal cord and the nerves coming off my spinal cord, we're going into my spinal cord. The way it is structured right next to the cord is there's a teeny tiny little bit that is sensory and a teeny tiny bit that is motor. Very, very quickly they join. So if they join, the nerves that go out to the body will have what in them? It's not a trick question. Say it again. If these join together, what kind of nerve fibers will we now have in this nerve? Awesome. Mixed. Mixed. Because in this, the sensory and the motor join. Are you with me? So let me tell you again, if you cut yourself in half and you look down inside at your spinal cord, which is like a little round structure, immediately coming off of that on both sides, we have a little bit of nerve. In the back, it's sensory. In the front, it's motor. They immediately join to form what's called a mixed spinal nerve. And the mixed spinal nerve has what in it? Sensory and motor. Are you with me? So if you're talking about the nerves that go out to your extremities, they're going to be mixed spinal nerves that have sensory and motor running in them. So you don't just have sensory nerves, you don't, it's different with cranial nerves, but talking about the body from the neck down. The nerves that go out to our extremities, the deep nerves will be mixed. Okay? We have some superficial sensory ones, but the big ones will be mixed. Are you with me now? Okay. For some reason, coming off the cord, we just have a little segment that's sensory and a little segment that's motor. That's what this mnemonic stands for. Are you with me now? Does that make sense? Okay. So, if we're talking about motor, outgoing or incoming? Outgoing. I guess is what the E is? Efferent. So is that going to be anterior or posterior? Anterior. Anterior. Do you see what I'm doing with this mnemonic? And anterior is also known as ventral. Okay. It's basically true with the brain, too. Basically. Pretty much, actually. If you. <laughs> I can't draw. You guys know that, right? Okay, so imagine this is the brain, right? Okay. There's a central line we'll learn in a little bit. So towards the front would be sensory or motor. 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 Towards the back is sensory. Vision, hearing, speech, comprehension. So I'm going to be behind that central line. Okay, all right. So if you have someone who has a tumor in their frontal lobe, chances are they might have some damage to their motor function. Do you see where I'm going with this? If somebody has a tumor in the back of their brain behind that central line, there's a word for it, we'll get to it. They're probably gonna have some sort of what? Sensory, Sensory issue, are you with me? <clears throat> if you have a tumor in the front of the cord, it's probably going to be motor issues, right? See, there's methods of my madness. If you have damage on the poster, it's probably going to be sensory. Got it? If it's in the middle, you're screwed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you're screwed anyway. Tumors and brains are just not good, you know. Although, I know people who have small benign ones that function very well. So, it's a real crapshoot when it comes to the brain. So, um, if you have it it's seriously in the middle and it's on both sides, you'll have motor and sensory. And the bad part is that the primary motor and sensory for the body is right on that midline. So if you have a tumor right on that central midline, you're going to affect motor to the body and sensory from the body. So that would be bad. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Good. Okay, sort of kind of making sense. This is one of those things that it's going to make sense little bits and pieces, right? And it just starts to grow and grow. Neuro is, good, thank you. Neuro is complicated. I've taught neuro for years. And 
um, I mean, this could be an entire class unto <coughs> itself. Okay? So that being said, if there's something that is not making sense, ask me, okay, before we move on. All right? <coughs> so neurons are nerve cells. They're going to communicate with action potentials, okay? Action potentials are going to be something that we will spend time on unto themselves. Does, but let me explain the generalities of it. Does anybody understand how electricity works? It's the movement of what? Current. Of a, of a current of ions, an electron, right? The movement of those electrons or ion. Let's go with ions. I don't know if that's really appropriate or not, but that's how we're going to learn action potentials. Moving down a wire is how we get electricity. Ions moving down a nerve is what creates what are called action potentials. Action potentials are what make muscles and nerves work. Okay, and we're going to study them completely in depth. And the basic gist is we move ions into and out of nerves and muscles, creating a current, which creates an action potential, which is what makes them work. Okay, complete separate topic. Okay, we have sensory nerves we know, we have motor nerves we know. We also have interneurons. <coughs> And that's actually pretty easy. What do you think an interneuron is? A nerve that is inside, specifically in between. Okay, so we'll have sensory information. For example, let me give you a really simple example. We're going to go over it. Okay, what am I doing when I do this? I'm checking a what? Reflex. Reflex. Okay. My body senses that this muscle is being overstretched, so it shortens it. Okay. Because if we really overstretch a muscle, we'll actually pull it right off the bone. So it's actually a protective mechanism. So that sensory information comes in by the sensory nerve to what part of my cord, back or front? Um, sensory to the back. Into the back. Talks to an interneuron right at the cord that sends a signal to the motor nerve down to this muscle. Are you with me? So interneurons will be the ones that are between the sensory and motor transmitting that information. Okay? Are there also interneurons that go up to the brain? Telling me that I just got hit many? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'm trying to give you a really simple. And what would that be called? This is a, it begins with an R. Reflex. Okay, it's a reflex. All right. Okay. So, make sense? All right. So, nerve structure, very simple basics. So, cell body has the nucleus. Okay. And um, I think we're actually going to look at pictures. I'm trying not to put a lot on the whiteboard. I was going to draw it. We'll look at a picture in the next slide or two, I'm sure. So cell body is going to have the nucleus. And then you're going to have projections coming off the cell body. Okay. We're going to deal with a couple of different types. But the main one we're going to look at is a, what's called a multipolar neuron. It's in the notes. So we'll have multiple what are called dendrites. Dendrites just look like the trees, uh, the branches of a tree and they bring information into the cell body to be processed. We send a signal out by the axon. So the three parts are dendrites, <coughs> cell body, axon. Dendrites bring the information into the cell body. It's processed. The axon is what we send the information out on. Okay. Always remember axons send information away, A and A. Okay. Axons send information away. Dendrites bring information in. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep information going one way. It'd be going both ways, and signals would get confused. The type of cells that we have in the central as well as the peripheral nervous system are lumped into two groups. There's nerves or neurons is another term. Do I have that up there? Okay, so neuron is another 
phrase for a nerve cell. And there's neuroglia, or glial cells. Those are the cells that help to support and nourish neurons. Okay. So neurons and neuroglia are glial cells. Support and what else? Nourish. Support and nourish. Oh, nourish. And protect. Okay. <clears throat> this is a little confusing, so don't write anything until you listen to me for a minute. In the central nervous system, we have microglial cells. The microglial cells are the macrophages of the central nervous system. Unlike the macroglial cells, which are the rest of the protective cells. Are you with me? So microglial cells are the macrophages of the central nervous system. All right. Macroglial cells are these other cells that we're gonna talk about. Are you with me? Okay. We need macrophages in the central nervous system, God forbid, some sort of infectious agent and or dead cells build up in the central nervous system. And that's what those microglial cells do. The macroglial cells provide other functions. Astrocytes help to support and nourish the central nervous system cells. That's one of their main jobs. and there's a picture of them here. They tend to have one cell body and multiple processes which surround multiple neurons, astrocytes. You probably can't read that, can you? No. Out there. No, you can? Okay. Epidymal cells are going to line the fluid-filled cavities of the central nervous system. You can see they are just about as simple cuboidal and they actually have cilia and they help to move the fluid through the ventricles, okay, epidymal cells. Does that make sense? So astrocytes support and nourish. Epidymal cells look like these little cuboidal ones. They line the fluid-filled ventricles, and we're gonna look at ventricles in a little bit, okay? The epidymal cells help to protect from any infectious agents. It's selective as to what it'll allow to cross over into the brain tissue from those fluid-filled cavities. Because it's like a barrier? It is. Because is it good or bad to get bacteria and viruses into the brain? Bad. No, yeah. very bad, very bad, right? <laughs> get cephalitis, you know, men meningitis, etc. So these epidymal cells line those fluid-filled cavities to make sure that there's nothing in that cerebral spinal fluid that should be getting through and or protects from it getting through. Okay. So where are they located? In the ventricles. Would this be the blood? And a couple of other areas too. It contributes to the blood brain. Part of that blood brain is gonna be along the capillaries as well, which we'll talk about. Okay. All right. The blood brain barrier is not like one thing, it's multiple things. So people get a little confused, whatever. We will get into that. All right. The last thing with these microglial cells are oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes make what's called myelin. I think that's in the next few slides here. Hold on. and we're, we're going to get into the specifics in a little bit here, okay? Myelin is a fatty sheath that we put around axons, okay? 
We'll get into the specifics of it in just a few slides. And what that fatty sheath, it wraps around the axon. I always think of, um, you know, Auntie Annie's, that store, they do the hot dogs with the croissants all the way around them. Like, if you imagine a really long hot dog and a lot of those croissants, that's what the myelin sheath kind of reminds me of. Oligodendrocytes tend to make bigger ones and Schwann cells make smaller ones. But that sheath, that fatty sheath around the axon helps to speed transmission of nervous signals. So instead of having to travel all the way down one axon, it can actually be moved really quickly. Okay. Are you with me? So oligodendrocytes create that in the central nervous system. We have a different cell that creates that in the peripheral nervous system called the Schwann cell. It will create the myelin that goes along the axon sheath in the peripheral nervous system. The reason that is important is if we damage a nerve in the central nervous system, does it fix itself? No. This is why people end up with spinal cord damage that's permanent. If you cut a nerve in the peripheral nervous system, can it repair itself? Sure can if you get the ends close enough. That's the key. For some reason, oligodendrocytes will not allow the nerves to repair themselves in the central nervous system. As opposed to Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, actually it'll create a new tube of myelin and it guides the ends of the nerves to regenerate and grow back together. Are you with me? So they're actually trying to take Schwann cells and put them into the central nervous system to repair. I don't think it's successful, obviously, because we haven't heard that. Okay. All right. Are you with me? Does that make sense? So, um, oligo um, dendrocytes, mm -hmm. they do not repair. Mm -hmm. One cells repair. Mm -hmm. Somebody drop the drop the uh, bucket or whatever. I'm trying to think of. You know what I mean? Somebody made a mistake there. You know, because that's where we really need the repairs in the central nervous system. I mean, yes, of course, peripherals as well, but all the important stuff is in central. So the oligodendrocytes don't repair those nerves. That's why if somebody has spinal cord damage, it's permanent. So oligodendrocytes only in spinal cord? Yes, and brain. And brain. And brain. Yep. And then Schwann cells, peripheral nervous system. Good. Any other questions? Right. Satellite cells are just, they support and nourish those peripheral nerves, okay, much like the astrocytes. Realize there's other cells, there's other functions I'm giving you, believe it or not, <coughs> basics, okay. Any questions about those groupings of cells? Okay. So. This is a picture showing the Schwann cell forming this myelin sheath. And like I said, it's not one big long tube in the peripheral nervous system. It's these little areas of myelin that go <clears throat> along just the axon. Okay? So, kind of, well, well, anyway. Here's a cell body of the neuron. Let's just look at this part being the axon, and it's showing it's showing a different form that I'm going to teach you. So don't worry about this side. Just pretend it's one axon coming out, and you'd have dendrites coming in. Okay, all right. The majority of the myelin is going to be on the axons. Okay. On um, in the central nervous system, it's like just one long tube. There's no space between. I think that there's some, but I think the tube's a lot longer. With the Schwann cells, there tends to be, you'll have one Schwann cell around here, as opposed to the oligodendrocytes actually put out multiple, you don't even need to know this, multiple processes and myelinate what it can reach. Okay, but good question. 
All right, so that's what this little myelin sheath looks like, those little like croissant bowls, right? Okay. Now, I think there's another picture. Yeah, we'll look at another picture of myelin in just a few slides. Neurons are also known as nerve cells. They are long living. They have to be because they are amitotic. Okay, what does amitotic mean? They don't reproduce. They don't replicate. Okay. We are finding through research stem cells though. Do you understand the concepts of stem cells? Stem cells are undifferentiated cells that when put into the environment of a tissue, they take on the attributes of that tissue. So they actually can harvest stem cells from multiple areas in the body. One of the stem cells for the nervous system is actually through the nasal cavity that they've found. So there's lots of interesting research out there. Okay. But in theory, as we know right now, they're amitotic. So that means if you damage, sever, or um, you know, have a tumor somewhere, that nerve will be permanently damaged. It cannot regenerate new nerve cells. Unlike your skin, where I'm wearing off hundreds of cells right now, which is fine, because I'm gonna make more skin cells. Okay, are you with me? So if you, um, damage, once again, just to make clear, the peripheral nerves, if you cut it, so suppose you're cutting, a friend, this happened to a friend of mine, she was cutting, I don't know why, frozen fruit, okay, and she cut her finger and lost sensation to the tip of the finger and waited 10 days to go get it surgically repaired, well, guess what? It's too late because you won't create a new nerve there. But if she'd gone and gotten the ends approximated, the Schwann cells would have wrapped around it almost like a bandage and allowed it to regenerate. It's not that you're creating new cells, it's that you're allowing those peripheral nerves to repair themselves. Does that make sense? Just wanna make that clear. Okay, all right, good. High metabolism. You will, <clears throat> shunt all the glucose from other organs in the body to send it to the brain in the spinal cord. Because without the brain, we're what? Dead. 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 Okay. You'll shut down other organs, take glucose from them, and send it to the brain to keep yourself going. Okay. The brain is highly, highly metabolic. It uses tons of oxygen, tons of glucose. That being said, if you are not able to breathe, how long can you last? Like tops, a couple minutes, right? Isn't it like rules of threes? Like three minutes oxygen, three days water, three weeks food, or something like that, give or take, okay? So it's because the brain uses so much glucose and oxygen to keep itself going. Highly metabolic. All right, so cell body, also known as perikaryon or soma. I, I would never ask you that, okay? You can know it as cell body. There's no centrioles, which I know we kind of brushed over centrioles. I'm always trying to pick and choose what's the most important. But centrioles are used for what? Does anybody remember from cell bio? Aid in cell division. What? Aid in cell division. Yeah, the aid in cell division. So if we don't have centrioles, we don't have cell division. We don't have mitosis, right? Okay. There's rough endoplasmic reticulum to create proteins that's called missile bodies. Okay, in there, it's just it's the same thing as we have in other cells, but we've named it missile bodies. Okay, <clears throat> and it's because you can see it when it stains. Now, most importantly, what I want you to start thinking about, okay, is dendrites do what? Signals in bring signals into the cell body. The cell body has the nucleus, so most likely that's gonna be where we what? Process. Process information. The axon then does what? Sends it away. Sends it away, are you with me? Okay, so 
In the brain, we have collections of cell bodies called nuclei. So most likely, those will be areas that do what? Transmit information or process it? Process it. So let me repeat. There are areas in the brain called nuclei. They are collections of cell bodies. These are areas in the brain where we process information. We have to start organizing where information's going. How much information are you taking in right now? Right? You've got to keep it organized. You're thinking about dinner last night, when you're going to get your next coffee, how your clothes feel, incoming information, oh my gosh, this is too much, right? All this information needs to be very specifically led to different areas. Are you with me? We're going to start learning those areas. So in general, cell collections of cell bodies in the brain are called nuclei. Collections of cell bodies that process information in the periphery or the peripheral nervous system are called ganglia. Ganglia. So collections of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system are called ganglia. Does it sort of kind of make sense? We're going to go over that again. Okay. All right. information is processed. We're going to talk about how we transmit it. In the central nervous system, we transmit information on what are called tracks. And I always remembered this just like the tracks of a train. We have tracks running from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. Okay? Tracks that go from the brain to the body are, are going to control motor or sensory. From the brain to the body. Motor. From the body to the brain would be sensory. Are you with me? Okay. So I hit myself in my thigh. I send that sensory information to the back of my cord. Are you with me? It travels through a ganglia. The ganglia are collections of cell bodies that process information. That sensory information comes into my cord and travels on a what? track up to my brain. Usually the opposite side, right? Most information crosses over. Do you guys know that? Are you with me? I go, ow, that was stupid, right? My brain then sends a signal down a track, which would be motor, out to my leg, pulling away. Are you with me? Okay, so tracks are just those train tracks going between the brain and wherever it exits the spinal cord. All right, so transmitting information. So for the most part, those are going to be axons, right? For the most part, those are going to be axons. Now, once it gets down to the level of the cord that's going to go out to the body, then goes on a nerve. Okay, so nerves are also collections of axons that are found in the peripheral nervous system. So tracks in the spinal cord nerves in the peripheral nervous system. Collections of axons in the spinal cord are called tracks. Collections of axons in the peripheral nervous system are your nerves. Does that help a little bit? Do you need me to repeat it? Yeah, please. Collections of axons in the spinal cord are called tracks. Collections of axons in the peripheral nervous system are called nerves. Do you need it again? We're good? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, dendrites bring the information in. I don't know why I have this again. Axons take the information out. 
don't worry about the organelles in the neuron. That's why I'm talking about you just cross that right off. One thing we will talk about is neurotransmitters, and this is in the notes later, okay? Neurotransmitters will be substances that go from one nerve to the next, okay? And we'll talk about that in the future. It's how we get the information from one nerve to the next. Sort of kind of making sense? Any questions? Okay. We're going to look at this structured nerve. This is called, and you can add this at the top, a multipolar neuron. Just like it sounds. M U L T I polar P O L A R neuron. So that means it has multiple processes. Okay? This is like 99% of the nerves in your body. This is why we're only going to focus on this one. This is the one that's most studied, most understood. Okay? So we have multiple dendrites coming into the cell body. You process the information and you send it out by the axon. At the end of this axon, we're going to release what to the next nerve? Neurotransmitter turns that nerve on, right? Are you with me? <clears throat> okay. Along this axon, we'll have those Schwann cells. No, not every axon is this myelinated. It depends on what the axon is and what it does. Some are highly myelinated, some are not. It okay. depends on what we need. Digestive nerves are lightly myelinated. They don't need to be fast. As a matter of fact, we want them to be slow, right? Because we want to process our food stuff slowly. Axons that go to muscles that create reflexive responses are fast and highly myelinated. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so you can see the Schwann cells as they come down here and it comes to a little terminal. You could have little projections coming off too here, sending out nervous signals to surrounding structures as well. Good? Any questions? Like when I was studying yesterday, I got a little confused um, between the Schwann cells and that. Uh, neural lemma. The neural lemma is the outermost membrane of the Schwann cell. Oh, okay. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah, good question though. But the main cell itself is the Schwann cell. And I have a picture that shows how it makes the myelin. Okay, and here we go. Here's this myelin sheath. So we understand there are segments of this myelin sheath. We're going to primarily focus on myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system, since it's basically like useless in the central nervous system. So we're going to look at the peripheral nervous system, although not useless, I shouldn't say that, okay? So only on the axons, it comes from the glial cells. In the central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes. In the peripheral, we have what again? That create Schwann cells, okay? that create the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. The neural lemma is just the outermost membrane. And what happens is the Schwann cell comes and it starts to wrap around. It's almost like a cinnamon roll, right? With a little hot dog in the center. And that outermost membrane of it is the neural lemma. Okay. And this picture is it from the end. So if I were to cut this one like this and turn it towards you, we're looking at the axon here with that myelin sheath around it that the Schwann cell has created. And what will happen is the action potential, which is that electrical activity that makes nerves work, doesn't get processed in this area of the Schwann cell. It only processes in the spaces. So it, I don't want to say jump. That's what people used to believe that it actually jumped. It doesn't jump. It processes here, and then it moves quickly to the next segment. So in essence, it's doing what to that axon? It's making it like almost, I don't want to say shorter, but what it has to travel through is shorter. OK, good? All right. Just so you guys know, the more good responses you give me, the quicker we move. Just saying, just saying. It makes me feel like I'm doing a good job. So, yeah. 
Okay, myelin sheaths in the peripheral nervous system. We learned about those Schwann cells that will wrap many times around, creating that myelin sheath. The neural lemma is that peripheral outermost portion of that Schwann cell, the outer layer. The nodes of Ron VA are the spaces between, okay? That's where the transmission of the action potential actually happens. And you can have what are called axon collaterals come off. It's just little branches that come off that axon that can go to the surrounding tissue. <clears throat> so it can affect more of the area or tissue around it, okay? Here's another picture of it if you want to check it out. Um, we learned this, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, nodes of Ron B are not present, it's much longer, there's no neurolemma, thinnest fibers are unmyelinated. What I want you to pri primarily remember is that oligodendrocytes cannot help with regeneration of the nerve. That's the main thing to remember with them because they're in the central nervous system, we can't regenerate those central nervous system nerves. And there's a picture of that oligodendrocyte. Remember I told you there's one and it has multiple processes. There's a picture of that. Okay. White matter, let me just see where I am in the notes. Hold on. One, two, three. Yeah, let's quickly go through this. Three more slides, we'll take a quick break. Okay. Okay, we get another Okay. White matter versus gray matter. When we're looking inside the brain, we're going to actually dissect the brains in a couple weeks. We're going to actually cut into them, and you will see white matter and you will see gray matter. Can anybody guess why it looks white in certain areas and why it looks gray in certain areas? More what in the gray? More condensed in the gray area. It's a great guess. Well, there's myelin in the white matter, there's no myelin in the gray matter. So, we know myelin is on axons, right? So if we're looking at an area of the brain that has white matter, will that be an area that processes information or transmits it? White matter. It will transmit it because there's myelin only on axons, axons transmit information. When you look at white matter in the brain, it will be areas that we transmit information. Same with the spinal cord. Do you need me to say that again? White matter in the brain and the spinal cord is made up of axons, myelinated axons. It is where we transmit information. Yes, no? Okay. Gray matter is unmyelinated cell bodies. Gray matter is unmyelinated cell bodies, and some dendrites are thrown in there too. Okay? Some dendrites might be a little bit of the white matter, but let's just say cell bodies and accents. Okay? So you keep it simple. So gray matter in the brain and the spinal cord is made up of cell bodies that does what with information? Transmits or processes? Processes. processes. Are you with me? Okay. So we're going to hack the brains and the spinal cord apart. Not so much the spinal cord, mostly the brain. And you see an area of white matter, you're going to know that's what? Primarily <laughs> myelinated <laughs> axons that transmits information. Okay. Gray matter will be collections of cell bodies, cell bodies, some dendrites, but the primary thing to remember is cell bodies because that's where we process information. Are you with me? Okay. Once again, just trying to get you to understand all the subdivisions of the brain. Okay. Okay. So this is going to be what? Myelinated. Myelinated axons. This is what? Myelinated, Myelinated axons. axons, right? This is actually going to be part of our motor function. Myelinated axons. Is it processing information? Transmitting. It's transmitting information. This. Gray matter. 
is gray matter. Unmyelinated cell bodies. Unmyelinated cell bodies processes information. Unmyelinated cell bodies processes information, right? Cerebral cortex, the outermost layers, gray cell bodies. Okay. Are there other cells mixed in there? Absolutely. I'm trying to get a point across. Okay. I want you to remember it as cell bodies that processes information, white matter that transmits. Okay. So structural classification, we looked at the multipolar. That's the one I just showed you with all the dendrites going into the cell body. Is that still recording? Can you look and see? Yeah. Is it? Yep. Okay, great. I think it's on a 30 minute timer, so. Multipolar is gonna be the multiple dendrites going into the cell body with one axon. There's also bipolar, which has an axon coming in, or I'm sorry, dendrite coming in one end, axon going out. I'm not gonna really go over too much of these, okay? Unipolar actually has a body with one process that splits. Okay, just to tell you. What we're going to focus on is multipolar. Okay? When we get to where these are, I'll explain them to you. How does that sound? Okay? So, sensory and motor, we get, and interneurons talk between them. We get that too, right? Because we've gone over that. Do you have any questions about this? Okay. Reflex. And I briefly went over this. We're going to go over this again, but let's look at this. So a reflex helps to do what for us? What's its general purpose? Yeah, protection. Survival. Low response. Fast. Fast. We will actually process reflexes right at the spinal cord. Okay, and we do that. So we have a what response? fast response. We have whatever noxious or damaging stimulus it is coming into the core through that sensory nerve into the back. Immediately talks to an interneuron which creates an immediate motor response out of the front of the cord. Are you with me? Quick, simple, effective. Do we also sense it in the brain? Yeah. Absolutely. But we have that quick response in place to make sure we have that protective mechanism happening. Okay? Are we good? A lot of information I know. So, that's the very basics of tissues, of the introduction to tissues. We're gonna move into some of the function. And this is where it gets a little wonky, but once again, if you have a question, stop me, and I'll be more than happy to explain it. This is also going to build as we move along, okay? So, neurophysiology. Um, I don't, we don't even really need to get much into this because we went over the electrical current when speaking about that and the movement of ions. That's basically what I want you to understand. So I won't test you on this slide. I don't want to say don't worry about it, but I want you to understand the movement of the ions into and out of the cells that will help to create that electrical current known as an action potential. Okay, done. No, I'm not going to ask about voltage or current. Though. Okay. So, what you do need to understand, and we've actually gone over this, is those protein channels that are in the cell membrane. Okay. Remember from chapter three or two, I forget which specific chapter it was in, because I think I actually repeat it in both of them, the protein channels that are in that phospholipid bilayer. Okay. Those have multiple functions. The reason this will apply with neurophysiology is because through them, we're gonna pass the ions that we spoke about, okay? And the two primary ions that we'll talk about are sodium and potassium, okay? Do you remember that whole conversation? Where is the higher concentration of sodium ions? Is it outside or inside of a resting cell? Outside. outside. The majority of potassium will be where? Inside. Inside. So remember <clears throat> those basics. So we have channels that are just specific for sodium. And because sodium's at that higher concentration, it'll try to leak into the lower concentration inside of the cell. There are specific channels just for potassium. So potassium can leak through those channels. Are you with me? Okay. And then we have another channel called a sodium-potassium 
pump. Do you remember that we went over? That helps to reestablish sodium out and potassium in. Okay, those are the basic gists of what we're going to talk about. So does everybody have a good working knowledge of that concept of those protein channels? Is there anything I could explain further at this point? With that, no? Okay. So the more, more positive current stays inside, right? It depends on where you are. So if you're at a resting cell, the cell membrane is actually going to be negative, negative 70. What happens is, in a resting, so basically out of this, before I forget, we're only going to focus on these, these voltage ones that have the um, charged particles moving through it. Let's look at a resting cell. Well, let me look at the notes first and see. Yeah, okay. So we're going to focus on those voltage gated ones, okay? So what happens with Let me turn on the light again. With a so this is a resting cell. So you have those protein channels through the cell membrane, right? Some of them are sodium specific, some are potassium specific. There are hundreds of that, okay? Okay, so in a resting cell, we like to keep sodium on the outside. Okay. And we'll have more what on the inside? Potassium. Okay. In addition, we're going to have negative proteins on the inside of cells. So not only do we have positive charges, we also have negative charges. And that's how we can get that negative charge across the membrane, okay? And outside, we tend to have what ions? Chloride, right, on the outside as a negative ion. Are there other negative ions? Absolutely, okay? I'm just trying to give you the majority of what you would see. What is the PR thing in the middle? Proteins, oh, okay. negatively charged proteins. Oh, that's it, okay. Yeah. Okay. The potassium are positive, the proteins are negative. The sodium is positive, the chloride are negative. Where is sodium going to want to go, though, if you're just talking about diffusion? In the cell. Right. Sodium's at a higher concentration out. It's drawn to the negative charge of the cell, of the resting cell, too, because don't forget the cell membrane's negative 70 and it's going to sneak its way into the cell trying to balance out solutions. So there's a lot of factors. There's charges, and there's also the balancing of solutions that happen inside and outside of cells. So sodium is going to sneak its way in through sodium channels, right, in a resting, because the cell is organic too. It's not just going to get to one phase and stay there. It's just like us. It's going to move and change and send things out and send things in, right? Right, so sodium leaks in through sodium channels. Potassium will try to leak out, right? So then we kick in the sodium potassium pumps. Do you remember that? I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm kind of on a roll, so I'm just going to stick with it, okay? The sodium potassium pumps kick in, right? They will push three sodium out, two potassium in to maintain what? Yes, the that chemical gradient, but also the what on the cell? The negative 
the negative charge of the cell. Okay, so with a resting cell, all these dynamics will happen, but that cell wants to stay at negative 70 millivolts. Do we understand those concepts? Okay. Are we good with that? Okay. So we're maintaining what's called an electrochemical gradient. It's the balance of the solution and also the charge of the cell. Okay? Just to keep it simple. Okay. So with our resting cell membrane, it can vary, but the number I want you to remember is negative 70. If it diverges much from that, the cell will kick in the ATP-powered um, sodium-potassium pump and try to reestablish that negative 70. Okay? So it can vary from 40 to 90. Okay? Um, that sodium is going to slowly leak in, potassium is quicker to leak out, we know that those sodium potassium pumps reestablish where they should be. They're like naughty kids, right? Try to push them back to where they should be. Does that all make sense? And the reason that we know this is they actually used to take a squid axon and it's big enough that they could check the voltage across that cell. It was so big. And they could see, God bless you, all these electrical changes. And this is how we studied and learned all these things. Okay. Is this making sense? Okay, so mess, resting membrane, negative 70. Okay, we're ready for the next step then, right? Move on. Okay, so the cell is organic, right? It doesn't just stay the same all the time. It has ions trying to leak in and ions trying to leak out. So if we have ions crossing it, what's it going to do to the charge of that cell membrane? Is it going to stay the same? No. No. It's going to constantly change a little bit. That constant little change is called a graded potential. It's just a small change in the cell membrane, either more positive or more negative. So it's constant change of uh, uh, electric charge? Correct. Okay. A little more positive, a little more negative. Are you with me? Does it make sense? Graded potential. Okay. If it goes above negative 70, it is called depolarization. Okay. If it goes below negative, so depolarization is above 70. So they put together a little graph you can see here. Here's time in milliseconds. Here's voltage in millivoltage. Here's zero, because don't forget we're always turning it negative because a resting cell is negative 70. Okay? So depolarization is above, above negative 70. Hyperpolarization is below negative 70. Okay? Good? Does that make sense? This all plays into all the steps of what we're going to have to talk about with activating a nerve. So it becomes more negative with hyper. Correct. More negative than negative 70. Right. Right? Okay. Yeah. I don't want you to think we're starting from no, zero baseline. No, no. Yeah, because no, people get thrown by that a little bit. Okay? We good? What's repolarization again? Which one? I'm sorry, I was drinking. Repolarization? We're going to get to that. We're not there yet. Depolarization is here. It's a slight increase from negative 70. Hyperpolarization is below that. We're going to get to depolarization. Or repolarization is just below that. Okay. Any other questions? Are you getting the gist of this? So we're moving ions. We're just changing the charge. It's either a little less negative or a little more negative. Okay. Okay. Because now we move into an action potential. And an action potential is what again? By definition. A stimulus that makes a muscle or nerve work. This is an electrical stimulus which makes a muscle or nerve work. We're going to go through these steps. Okay? So this 
we're going to look at this graph and then we're going to jump ahead. Hold on just a second. Yeah, we're going to kind of do this in reverse. So here's our little cell, right? Has a little depolarization, a little hyperpolarization. Then all of a sudden, we get enough of a stimulation that we're going to stimulate that nerve. Just like I moved my hand forward, I had to stimulate that to do it. That was through action potentials in both the nerves going to the muscle and the muscles itself. In order to do that, my graph would show like this in the muscles and the nerves. It shows that those muscles and nerves worked. And it graphs out by creating this high peak. We're going to go through all of those steps. Because there's a much bigger movement of sodium and potassium ions creating this electrical change. Are you with me? Okay, we're going to go through all of those steps showing what goes where. Okay. And actually, we're going to jump ahead a little bit because I think this is one of those times that a picture is worth a thousand <clears throat> words. Okay. So, this shows what? This shows no, just millivoltage, right? Zero, here's our negative 70. This is milliseconds. Okay? We're studying the voltage across an axon. It's just like we've got little voltmeters stuck in the axon. We're monitoring the charge of that axon. We decide that we're going to make that muscle or nerve work. Are you with me? We send a stimulating um, signal to it, and what happens is sodium channels open. So just think before you write. Just think. This is all in the notes. Look at me and just think. If you open sodium channels across that cell membrane, sodium's going to go from where to where? Outside. Out to in. It's dying. It's knocking on the door. Let me in. You open the channels, you say, all right, come on in, right? If it enters the cell, that cell then becomes more what? Positive. Positive. All the way up to positive 30. Okay? Don't write any notes. Just listen. It's all in the notes. Party's over. Doors are closed. Sodium's not allowed in anymore. Okay? You've got to get rid of some of the leftovers, though. Right? So you're going to open potassium. If you open potassium channels, potassium goes from where to where? Outside. Potassium's sick of the party. It wants to leave. It leaves from the inside of the cell through specific potassium channels to outside of the cell. The cell now becomes more what? Negative. Negative. Are you with me? Sodium channels are slow. So they overshoot a little bit. And then what kicks in? Sodium, potassium pumps, and they regulate the cell back to its resting negative 70. Okay? with an action potential that makes nerves work. There are several steps that happen. The cell starts at negative 70, that is resting. It gets stimulated. Sodium channels open. Sodium rushes into the cell, making it more positive, peaking at positive 30. Sodium channels close. Potassium channels open. Potassium leaves the cell, making the cell more negative. Those channels are slow to close, it hyperpolarizes, and then sodium potassium channels or pumps kick in to regulate it. Okay, let's go back and look at the steps. I think that this picture is great to study from them. Okay, so depolarization we know is moving up. Actually, let me go back to that picture. Hold on. You might want to write this on this picture. So this is depolarization, that is the upswing up to positive 30. Once it starts going down, this is repolarization. Repolarization? Repolarization. Re Re and all these steps are actually written down for you. Repolarization goes to negative 70. Once it goes below negative 70, it's hyperpolarization. Okay, so depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization are the steps. Okay?
Yes, no? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we go back, depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization is written out for you. But I also have the steps. Okay, so resting. Sodium's trying to leak in, potassium's trying to leak out. Depolarization is when sodium rushes into the cell. Now this makes it sound like the whole cell is open and all the sodium is rushing in. It's not. Okay, realize we're talking about this like this is a huge thing, but it's just a small segment that it's happening to at a time. Okay, so depolarization is when sodium rushes into the cell. We reach what is called threshold. Okay, remember we started at negative 70. So those graded potentials will kind of move up and down a little bit. Once it reaches negative 55, that is called threshold. Sorry, I'm standing right in front of it. It means there will be an action potential. There's enough momentum in that direction, you will have an action potential. Okay, so negative 55 is threshold. Repolarization is when those sodium gates close, potassium rushes out of the cell. Hyperpolarization is because those potassium gates are slow, to keep it really simple. Okay. Yes, no? Sort of, kind of? Okay. We actually go over this again, because I know it's complicated. You said what pump is slow to close? After the potassium. That's why you have that little bit of hyperpolarization at the end. Okay, we'll go over this again in the future. Okay. Does it sort of kind of make sense? Like 40, 50% makes sense at least? Okay. Okay. So sodium potassium pumps, I think we understand this. This is to redistribute or replace the ions where they should be. Right, you pump three sodium out, two potassium in, thereby giving you that negative charge on the cell. Right, do you guys remember that? I'm going through that quickly because I feel like I've gone through it a couple times. Okay, but of course if it doesn't make sense, it comes to me. <clears throat> okay, action potential only goes one way, right? We have them going both ways, we have confused signals. And axons also always go away from the cell body. It begins at what's called the axon hillock. Actually, let me show this to you in a picture really quick. Because <clears throat> you should know this. Where's the picture of that multipolar neuron? There it is. Okay, so here's the cell body. This widened area off the cell body is the axon hillock. It then narrows down into the axon itself. Okay, so it's the widened area that attaches the axon to the cell body. Axon hillock. potential to begin at that axon hill, it can go one direction, it's all or nothing. Either you have an action potential or you don't. Now, you could have more action potentials making it a stronger signal. You could have frequent sending of those signals making it a stronger signal. Okay? All right. Um, about negative 50, negative 55 millivolts is your threshold. That's what that should say there. So negative, so the numbers you should know are negative 70 is resting, negative 50 or 55, it depends on where you read, I would never ask you between them, okay, I'd give you one or the other, okay, is threshold. The peak of the action potential in nerves is positive 30. Those are the numbers that you should know, okay. What, yeah. 30, sorry. Positive 30 is yeah. the peak. And that's when sodium channels shut off and potassium open. Okay. Now, refractory period is the time when another action potential cannot occur. Okay. There's some variation with this. So I want you to just learn it for our purposes, as it is a time when an action potential cannot occur. There's a period of time the nerve needs to reset before there's another action potential. There's exceptions to this. I don't want to get into it with you guys. Okay, so let's just call it refractory period is a time when the nerve needs to reset and we can't have another action potential. Okay. Well, I actually have it. 
then so let's keep it at that. That'll be fine. Okay. So conduction of a nervous impulse. Um, the size of the axon and the degree of myelination will determine how quickly a signal is sent. It's as simple as that. So the bigger the axon, the faster we can send a signal. The more myelin, the faster we can send a signal. That's all that means. That's pretty straightforward. You're like, thank God. Something that makes sense, right? Okay. Right. Action potentials are all or none, right? Once it reaches threshold, it's going for it. Other than that, it will not. It self-propagates means that once it starts down an axon, it's going to go the full length of the axon until it's reached the end or the terminal. Speed of transmission is going to vary between 5 to 250 miles per hour. It's a huge difference, isn't it? Okay, depending on what we need done, the diameter of the axon and the amount of myelin is what will change that. Okay, and then the amount of transmission, of course, we mentioned earlier. Okay, so let me see. I have. Let me just take a quick look. Okay, let's finish up these last few slides. So, multiple sclerosis, some bread and butter stuff. No, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, um, this is an autoimmune disease, right? So, do we understand what autoimmune means? It means that our body attacks its own tissues for some reason. And the reasons are not totally clear to us. This is why we can't cure these things yet. For some reason, somebody with multiple sclerosis, they will attack that myelin sheath and either wear away at it or it hardens and becomes plaque-like. That decreases the ability or the function of the axons to send signals out to the body. So what usually will happen in one of the first signs or symptoms are visual disturbances. And they might be really minor. So the patient might say, I get in my car and it takes me a minute to focus as I'm driving. Or another really subtle sign or symptom is that they go to brush their hair or pick up their coffee and it drops. So it might be really, really subtle at first. And what's happening is those motor tracks in the spinal cord are getting either the myelin damaged or hardened. So you can't send those signals as appropriately as you would before. But it can also be sensory as well, right? Visual is a sensory input. They might have numbness or tingling, okay? It can lead up to loss of muscle control, speech disturbances, urinary incontinence, because that's a muscular control as well, okay? Um, so impulses conduct slowly and eventually may cease. The treatment, though, to delay the symptoms and the signs is really good. So the important thing clinically to speak about with that is if you think someone might have MS, you want to send them out sooner than later to get tested. <clears throat> because the sooner they get all the medicinal intervention, the more you can delay those signs and symptoms. Okay? And sometimes it'll go into remission. Pretty crazy. The other crazy thing is that this is mostly seen in areas that we don't have a lot of sunshine. So there's some possible link with vitamin D deficiencies with this, which is interesting to me. But isn't it like a hereditary disorder? Not necessarily. There might be some genetic components, but it can definitely happen to people it's that no don't have any. This, right? No, no. But I mean, they can really delay the symptoms, which is great. Because I knew somebody growing up who had it. It was very, it was just horrendous. It was awful to watch her go through it. So, um, so here are some of the, I don't do, do drugs, just so you know. Multiple ways I don't do drugs, but I don't teach drugs. So all of this that comes from your book, I sort of throw in there. Okay, some immune modifying. Drugs, I also know that they do use steroids, and those steroids help too. Steroids are like the magic bullet to throw at people. The thing with steroids is it can destroy your tissues, is the thing if you're on it for a long period of time. But it can hold those symptoms at bay and reduce complications <coughs> and disability. Here, this picture is not great, 
um, to see. You can just barely see it becomes slightly whiter in here. If you want to see better examples, you can absolutely Google, you know, normal versus MS online. I think part of it is how this translates onto the screen. But you'll see those white plaque-like structures starting to deposit into the brain and or spinal cord. Okay. Nerve fiber classification will be diameter, degree of myelination, speed of conduction. This one's pretty easy. So group A fibers, large diameter, highly myelinated, somatic sensory and motor fibers. Okay, so those will be fast because they're big and highly myelinated. Group B, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, will be just as it sounds, intermediate in size, lightly myelinated, we'll see this <coughs> like in the autonomic nervous system. Group C, smallest diameter, unmyelinated, we'll see this say to the digestive tract. Okay, that are slower moving structures. Okay. So that one's pretty easy to understand. Right? Okay. Um, I think we're going to finish up. Yeah, we'll finish up this last little bit. Okay, so shooting the bullseye. If you could remind me, guys, to finish that last little segment on nervous tissue next time we meet. Okay, so welcome back. We're going to finish up a little bit of nervous tissue in this section. Are there any questions on last week's lecture? No? Okay. So, nervous tissue. We went through the basics of the structure of the neuron, the supporting cells, how the tissue is structured in the central nervous system, how it is structured in the peripheral nervous system, the collections of cell bodies are where things are processed, the collections of axons or tracts are where they are sent or transmitted. Every time you go to restudy something, you should try to think of things that way, okay? So, there's just a quick little review. Now we're going to talk about, well first of all, let me back up. What is an action potential? Um, just in general. <clears throat> That's, what the, like the That's a great way to remember. An action potential is what creates an action, right? Yeah. Because it makes what and what work? <laughs> Muscles and nerves. It's an electrical signal that is sent down the axon with the help of sodium and potassium moving in and out of the cell, right? Does that ring a bell now? Okay. So we send the action potential down the axon and it gets to the end of the axon. And at that point, it's got to do something else, right? It needs to talk to another, what? Structure of some sort. Another nerve, a muscle, a gland. Are you with me? Okay, we're sending that transmission for a reason. So in order for it to talk to the next structure, we need to send signals. What we're going to talk about, you can do them electrically. We're going to talk about the chemical. Okay, does anybody know what those chemical signals are that go from one nerve to the next nerve or to a muscle? It's a neurotransmitter. It's a neurotransmitter. Okay, they should sound kind of familiar, right? Okay, so these neurotransmitters are chemicals that send the signal from the nerve to the next structure. Are you with me? Okay, and this could be an entire lecture unto itself, right? So this is just the basic introduction of neurotransmitters. Okay, so shooting the bullseye, how information is transferred from a neuron to its target, okay? It's called synaptic transmission. We'll go over all these structures in just a second here. I just thought this was a cool picture. So this is the end of an axon. That signal or action potential comes down and you have little vesicles of the neurotransmitter that's being contained that will then be released to the next structure by that exocytosis that we spoke about. So, we have to talk about these anatomical structures. So just listen for a minute, okay? The space between the nerve and the next structure is called the synapse, okay? Okay, to picture that, it's just a space. The space before that is the presynaptic membrane. The space after it, therefore, would be the postsynaptic membrane. 
you're releasing substances from the presynaptic membrane to that postsynaptic membrane. Are you with me? Okay. The structure that we're going to talk about the most is a nerve talking to a muscle because that's a highly studied phenomenon. Okay. So can you imagine the signal coming down that presynaptic axon, releasing the neurotransmitter into the space? That neurotransmitter binds to the next structure and activates it. You're done. Okay. So if we look at this picture, this is the axon of the presynaptic, I call it a membrane, okay, but you could say presynaptic and, um, axon or whatever. I call it a membrane because it comes from this end. The action potential comes down, okay. Calcium is released, and that release of calcium facilitates the release of the neurotransmitter. Are you with me? Okay, the neurotransmitter comes across, it binds to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane and it stimulates it. In this case, I think they might have a muscle there. No, they just have postsynaptic membrane. Easy peasy, right? Set that back, okay? So, there are some electrical, we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna briefly talk about chemical synapses. Okay, so, let's just do the steps, I know it's hard to see it on the board, but I would like to write these steps down for you. So for those on the video, if you can't see these, I'll repeat them a couple of times, okay? So we have the action potential, can I just abbreviate that, of the presynaptic Axon. Okay. Releases calcium at its end. That calcium then triggers the release of neurotransmitters. into the space, which is known as the, as the synapse, okay? Neurotransmitters bind to the what? Post synaptic membrane, whatever that may be whatever is being stimulated. Then more often than not, that postsynaptic membrane is either a nerve or a muscle, so it also has an action potential. Are you with me? As a result of being stimulated. Correct, okay, so one, action potential of the presynaptic axon travels down the axon to the end. Two, releases calcium at its end. Three, that calcium release stimulates the release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. Four, neurotransmitters bind to the postsynaptic membrane and stimulates it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, and if you have trouble reading that at home, don't forget you can back the tape up. All right? There's a little movie, but they changed all the links, so. Okay, so here's the thing, I don't do drugs, period. <laughs> I don't teach them, I don't do them, <laughs> right? I don't really know about them. If there's something you're really interested in, generally if you tell me what its mechanisms are, I can track it back to the physiology. But this I can tell you. Part of what these medicines do is attach to these receptors and either stimulate them or inhibit them. Right, a beta blocker is gonna do what to your heart rate? Slow it down, right? It's gonna inhibit that transmission. Are you with me? If you have asthma, you're gonna stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. Are you with me? So medicines can either be excitatory or inhibitory. They'll attach to the receptors, now listen to this, and either push that membrane closer to an action potential or further from it. 
it'll depolarize and make it more prone to be excited or hyperpolarize and move it away from being excited. Are you with me? Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so these can be either excitatory, depolarizing, or exciting that postsynaptic membrane. If you don't remember what depolarize means, we went over it last week. It's the movement on that graph of that electrical signal in millivolts, right? Depolarize means it moves it closer to an action potential. Hyperpolarize means it decreases and goes the opposite way, okay? So, and that'll inhibit it. So when you get into medicines, it's part of the physiology of those medicines. Okay? So, um, we just went through this. Uh, neurotransmitters, so we went through all this. Neurotransmitters are short-lived, so these responses are short, okay? After they have done their job, they can't just stay in the synapse, right? We've got to get rid of them so we have more room for new neurotransmitters. So a couple things can happen. They could be reabsorbed. They can simply be released from the receptors on that postsynaptic membrane and go back into that presynaptic axon. Does that make sense? Let me, let me go back to that picture just real quick. Okay. So if you release acetylcholine, per se, oh, don't even worry about it. If you release any neurotransmitter and it attaches, it can be detached from these receptors and just simply go back into the presynaptic axon. The neurotransmitters can break apart. And if they break apart, they'll just go into the tissues of the body and be reabsorbed. Okay? So, and then there's one more. Or they could be destroyed by enzymes. And what are enzymes again? Proteins. They are proteins. And what do they do to chemical reactions? They facilitate, right? they facilitate or speed them up. Okay. So one of these things will happen with these neurotransmitters. Okay. So three important neurotransmitters. There are tons of them. Okay. We're just going to touch upon a few of them and then a few more as we get into specific organ systems. Acetylcholine is one that goes to our muscles. It's one that we use very often. It's very well studied. We know the mechanisms of it pretty well. Okay. Some things that can inhibit acetylcholine is botulism. Okay. And those are those Botox injections. It's actually a form of botulism that they put in there. And what it does is it decreases the ability of acetylcholine to work in that area so you can't frown, so you don't have frown lines. Okay? Curare is, I believe, from a frog. It's a paralytic medicine that can paralyze you that'll also inhibit the ability of acetylcholine to work. Okay, just to give you some examples. Norepinephrine, we're going to talk about this with the sympathetic nervous system in a couple weeks. We'll get a little off here. Wait, is next week Columbus Day weekend? Uh, we don't have class next week, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Go have fun. You'll probably have to watch a little bit of videos at home, though. I'm sorry to tell you. But hey, we get a break. So that just popped in my head. Anyway, so that'll be a couple weeks out. Okay, we'll talk about uh, norepinephrine and its mechanisms in the sympathetic nervous system. Dopamine is a huge neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, and this is actually what's inhibited with Parkinson's. Did we speak about Parkinson's yet? I don't think so. So this is one of the neurotransmitters that gets inhibited with people with Parkinson's. It's a feel-good neurotransmitter, but it also facilitates a coordination of movements. So it's another neurotransmitter that's, I think, an important one for you to have a little bit of an introduction to, okay? So there are others as well, ATP, nitrous oxide, serotonin, substance P, I mean, blah, 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 blah. And I would never ask you about the laundry list, I'm just giving you examples. I would ask you about these three that we spoke about briefly, okay? And we'll talk about them more in the future as well. So, cocaine, just a little bread and butter kind of thing. Coke, not that cocaine's bread and butter, but you'll see people who do cocaine. All right, part of the issue with cocaine 
is that it doesn't allow the reabsorption of dopamine, which is one of our feel-good hormones in the brain. And it'll stain the synaptic cleft and it will keep triggering pleasure centers. Sounds good, right? Here's the problem. It increases the number of receptors because your brain goes, oh, I have more dopamine, I can feel even better. I'm gonna increase the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Are you with me? So then what happens when you stop taking cocaine? Withdrawal. There's gonna be withdrawal because now you have increased receptors. So your brain says, I need more dopamine, right? But because that was chemically derived, you can't do that on your own, so you want more cocaine, right? This is why it's so quickly and so highly addictive. So, um, because of those mechanisms. So dopamine keeps stimulating those pleasure centers because it binds and blocks the presynaptic membrane, keeping the dopamine in the synapse. Does that make sense? Okay. You increase the number of receptors, you need more cocaine to feel that same stimulation. So withdrawal happen because of those mechanisms, unfortunately, and that makes it very difficult to withdraw from cocaine. And here's just, I thought these were cool pictures, but I'm a dork, so what do I know? Neurotransmitters termination, we went through this. The enzymes will break them down, reuptake or diffusion just into the tissues. And I believe that's the last little bit of that lecture, right? Okay.